Hey there, good boys and girls. I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. And today's WebDM is brought to you by College Humor. We're gonna be having a look at their 5e modern game, Unsleeping City, which can be found over on the Dimension 20 YouTube channel. And uh, we're gonna tell you what we think. Uh, so go ahead and make your list, check it twice, and you're gonna find out it's actually pretty nice. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by College Humor Dropout's Dimension 20 Unsleeping City. For more info, go to dropout.tv and use the code ROLL50 for 50% 50 off the first month of your subscription. You also get the first week for free. There you can find all 17 episodes of The Unsleeping City. Link here and in the description. The Unsleeping City, the, the city that, that lies between. Yes. Between this world and the dream world. And the dream world. The intersecting plane of experience and magic and, and everything that, of, that, that could happen. The magical Will probably world, happen. The, the oneric realms and then mundane ass reality uh, come together. So it's a setting for uh, Dimension 20's new season of uh, actual plays. Mm -hmm. And we had a chance to kind of catch up on the first few episodes. And it's like, it's New York. Yeah, and so it's got that familiarity. You you know you're it's like the smell. It's the smell, <laughs> right? <laughs> it is a snowy, blustery day. Cold, crisp, clear skies over the best skyline of any city that has ever been or will ever be. It is New York City, baby. Snow flurries from the sky as the wind kicks up. We see gusts of freezing air blow past the Chrysler building, down through streets of honking cabs and just miserable looking pedestrians who crowd into the tunnels of the subways. Blast of laundry mixed with hot garbage and the sweet smell of the hot nut stands. The hot nut stands were what sold me because I was like, wait a minute, is New York a, always a Rin Fest? The only places you can get hot nuts are Rin Fests in New York? Like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. That's what, that was my first thought. Uh, but <laughs> Maybe if you fall asleep at the beach. <laughs> right. <But laughs> so, gonna worry about other things. Uh, <laughs> the King's Nuts. It's a, a, an actual play for D&D 5th Edition set in mm -hmm. a, a kind of like this dark, magical New York. But it is modern. It's which, modern. We, which... we have a lot of people ask us about this. Like, what would you do for D20 modern? What, yeah. like, how would you handle that? Yeah. And I think they do a pretty damn good job pretty, of yeah. just just laying the classes on these people and like how they would interact with the world. That was like my first hook. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick around and, and I want to know more because it's not the usual thing that you see. It's taking sort of like the familiar tropes of both fiction set within New York and making it d and ified but also taking the D&D tropes and making them modern and, and urban. I feel like talking a bit about just what we know about the world so far because it, that is what's gotten me really hooked. And then it was only later that I was like, holy shit, this is really funny. <laughs> like, oh. But the first was like, oh my God, this is an awesome setting. I love the fact that, you know, it's kind of set around Christmas. Uh -huh. And there's obviously a big uh, heavy fae influence yes. here. Uh, I mean, Santa would be uh, some type of fae. You would think uh, so, you, right? You would think. I mean, you know, they, they kind of do it as he's a powerful, like, sorcerer or wizard uh -huh. who clones himself. <laughs> And that's how he gets everywhere. Forgot about that. Because it's all a bunch of clones, which you really think about, like, why doesn't Santa just take over the world? I mean, you would have, I would, I would imagine it's burl. because Santa's a right jolly old elf. Well, he's lawful good. Yeah, I just wouldn't necessarily want to do any of that. He'll still break into your house, but he'll leave presents, so <laughs> it's not, it may be breaking thievery. and entering, but yeah, there's yeah. no thieving. Yeah. <laughs> you leave, he leaves you enriched after his breaking and entering. It's a very interesting realm. Yeah. Um, kind of reminds me of Cult or any of those other, like, where there's... Urban, there is urban fantasy kind of games. Urban fantasy yeah. where there's the, there's the real world and some people aren't tuned in to the, the yeah. mystical realm that lies just beyond the imperceptible veil, Yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so I like that, the fact that a couple of the people were were kind of noobs in that regard. Yes. It's a good way to introduce a complex setting, a new setting, but mm -hmm. also like you get to ride along with those characters. You know, you get to discover what they're discovering. Exactly. You know? Like yeah. the fact that you have a couple of the characters that are keyed in, yeah. but you, but the audience being those that don't know uh, can see themselves in uh, the, the, the couple of people yeah. that don't, aren't, that aren't keyed in. Yeah. And, and, and I think like just the overall, at least the, those, those first few episodes there were, you can tell that they're 
throwing out a lot of like just improvisational stuff or, or mm -hmm. throwing curves balls at each other yeah. uh, it seems and like really rolling with it you get a little bit and you're like well, what's going on and you get a little bit more and mm -hmm. so by the end of the climactic uh, you know action scene you're kind of like all right i have a very good idea of what this world is but not so clear a picture that I can fill in the gaps myself. I'm left with more questions mm -hmm. <laughs> now, and all of them are related to just the 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 extent to which the magic world uh, of the you know the magic of the dreaming world influences the waking world and mm -hmm. what's happening to the characters. How did those who are you know first becoming aware of this world? What was it about them <laughs> that gives them that ability? Uh, or power, and then for the other characters who who seem to already be familiar with this world, like you know, what's their deal? How do they keep this? How do they keep from just talking about this mm -hmm. all the time? Like you said, we people ask us about urban fantasy all the time, and and like D twenty modern type stuff, like how you play in a modern sort of mm -hmm. urban game, and, and we're always just like, well, just read the Dresden Files. And I mean, make for, it work. <laughs> for one, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's mostly because it's it's not a style of campaign that I personally run. So a lot of the advice that I have to give about it is you know either secondhand or just kind of like my random thoughts as opposed to like practical stuff. It's also one of those where when I think about modern urban, like urban fantasy, it's like, yeah, I, Dresden kind of does provide a good model and, and Unsleeping Switty, un Switty, <laughs> Unsleeping City follows in that, although I don't know how much, you know, Dresden inspired uh, uh, Brennan, but it's got Santa Claus, there's pixies and fairies mm -hmm. and there's d and It doesn't feel weird in the sense of like it all just being anchorless and made up. Like setting it in the modern world has keeps like such a solid frame of reference and covers so many things that you can just throw out like, oh yeah, these lion statues are talking to you now or the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the garbage can with the <laughs> like Oscar the Grouch. Basically, <laughs> the Oscar the Grouch is like, hey, come on now. You bump into someone and you hear them say, hey, watch it. You turn around and a trash can with two little eyeballs on top flaps its lid. It goes, problem standing right here by the doorway. Who needs some kind of piece of Okay. I need to take an upper. <laughs> uh, I love it because it's like, that's something that like I would do just on a lark. Just like, okay, the players are walking by and one of them is having a psychedelic experience while they're slowly unlocking the magic that's within them and crossing the boundaries of reality. Mm -hmm. And just like, screw it, some Muppet trash cans show up and start trying to pick a fight with you. Yeah, it, It's that level of willingness to go weird and just bizarre that like sold it for me. Using New York as yeah. a, a, a touchstone allows uh, Brennan, the, the GM, GM yeah. I think that he has some obviously very very evocative descriptions. Sure, yeah. In, in, in a few words can set a scene, uh -huh. you know, like I, like I could smell New York. I've never very been to like New York, yeah, but much. like in his More descriptions, I'm like, oh, I kind of want to throw up right now. Sure. You know, like, I, and, uh, and, and I've been once, that smells, yeah. you, you smell it soon enough when you get off the plane. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's right there. <laughs> We go through the hellish wasteland of Times Square, up, up, following snow again, over the bridge, Brooklyn Bridge, right here, through neighborhoods where families tuck their little bundled infants through strollers and walk down little lanes of trees, back through neighborhoods where, again, little corner stores sell hot bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches to morning commuters. A bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, the best thing you ever and they, and it costs like what, 250, 225? That's a deal. <laughs> sort of early to mid December morning in New York City. A city where so many people dream of coming and making a life for themselves. And it's always felt a little bit like maybe just around the corner, there's a little bit of magic. But like those evocative descriptions, it makes it that much easier to ev for everyone to get on the same page yeah. and to be grossed out at the same time and have those similar reactions. Because we've talked about what are you trying to portray versus what are the players seeing? Yes. And I think that there is no question about what everyone is seeing in this. Right. You're dealing with so many frames of reference. If you say you're crossing a crowded, uh, you know, bridge from Midtown Manhattan to Brooklyn, you've seen that in movies. You've got, you know, you've had pictures of it. You've had mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of exposure to this world already. So you have this frame of reference that means you are closer to being on the same page. Their use of of, of every of of the everyday nurses, and yeah. firemen, yeah. And just housewives, mm -hmm. desperate or otherwise. <laughs> um, 
and just like everyday people. Ex housewives. Um, ex yeah, <laughs> yeah de desperate ex housewife monks of New York. How they use kind of the mundane, and then you have a character like the druid, the rat man <laughs> who Congress. lives in the sewers. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I was wondering when gosh. pizza rat was gonna uh, show yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I was hoping. I was literally hoping there was at one point where they were grabbing food or something. I was like, please grab a slice of pizza. It's like, please just grab a slice of pizza and hold it in your mouth, yeah, and yeah. everyone will be happy. The blending of the fantastical and the mundane, uh, particularly within the party as, mm -hmm. as everyone gets introduced was really fun. And mm -hmm. I think starting the character introductions with the character that has the least, you know, sort of experience with this, but is also kind of the most prone to, to maybe brushing up against it because of heavy drug use. <laughs> well, heavy <laughs> drug know. use and the fact that they are, uh, we're talking about uh, Pete the Plug. Yeah, Pete the Plug, uh, yeah. Which is played by uh, Ali uh, Beardsley. It's a wild sorcerer. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're going through the greatest tr change. Uh, they're actually, their character's actually like trans, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in transition. But I love that they're going to get their, their top surgery at a mob doctor. Like that is just like, <laughs> like, well, like of course back, you would go like to a, a mob, doctor. mob doctor. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Lugosh. Another thing uh, is is the, the GM, he has got so many voices. Oh yeah, yeah. Like it's yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, how, like, it's got you know, the New York voices down. You know, like like, it's, it, it, like all, all 20 degrees of New York yeah. voice. <laughs> Starting there in like, in a, in a position of, of kind of vulnerability, of change. You're dealing and, with like mundane stuff, but, right? Like but, it's sort of like, okay. But right, everyday stuff. Um, you firmly established pretty early on, and it's a, it's a neat technique mm -hmm. to do, like if you are starting on a new campaign, is to kind of like just have an extended scene with a couple of the players or whoever that's just mundane. They just like go through an aspect of their day, make them roll some skill checks for regular stuff. Mm -hmm. And like even if you, you're like just doing that in the, at the very beginning, it can really help to sort of focus in on like these are just regular people, even if they're about to take this you mm -hmm. know, fantastic plunge into a hidden world of magic. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. even if those, uh, those checks are just concentration saves because they keep popping mushrooms. <laughs> Because Pete the Plug is based off of, uh, basically, the, they, they introduced them as Hunter S. Thompson, but younger, which, of course, I immediately was like, oh, younger S. Thompson. Younger S. Thompson. Um, <laughs> it was a great introductory character, and yeah. I love that it started there, because since they were one of the, the, the innocents or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the fact that, it, like, he rolled a die to determine who they start with, right? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. just like, you know, how random chance kind of starts you here. Then we move into uh, our, our desperate housewife, <laughs> uh, um, Sophia, who's played by Emily Axford, uh -huh. uh, who's, who's literally a drunken master monk, which, like, when I've never thought about Desperate Housewives of New York that way. They always just get drunk and start fighting. But it's just like, they all are just a bunch of drunken master monks. They get drunk, and then they get really good at fighting each other. It's very interesting, because, I mean, she's the other kind of innocent. Yeah, yeah. Like, just, re just sort of introduced to this, uh, to this world, but also kind of because they're seeing everything through the lens of this sort of grief based alcoholism it's yeah. it, you can you can get away with it and so it's it uh, or we get away with introducing them more fantastic elements without we'll get it Dale back seeming eventually. too uh too just uh you know out of left field those moments with uh with Sophia's character reminded me a lot of the way that say the world of darkness hunter game uh was uh, was presented where like, yeah one day you look at a person differently and you can see through the glamour you can mm -hmm. see that these are, you know, nasty little goblins in the hospital nursery, or that this is, these are a group of like, you know, brutish trolls who are about to go try to bum a cigarette off this lady or something like that. You know, you can see it because all the players, all the players are just really funny comedians. They're, they're, they're reacting really quick and mm -hmm. the, the, the flow and the pace, I don't know how exactly it's achieved, but like there seems to be just a, a snappy sort of flow and it, it really creates this immersive quality to watching them play. Well, There's just like, oh my God, you're, yeah. you really want to just check it out and take something home with you from watching it. Oh, know? most definitely uh, because they are like, I mean, they are improv, mm -hmm. act, comedy improv actors. So it, it, what you are seeing on display completely is the yes and, and like without question, without thought. Sure, you know? yeah, yeah. Like yeah. you're not really stepping on each other's toes, you're just always adding. 
Yeah. Everybody's always adding to the story, and, and when it, once it's added, you don't get to go and retcon anything. It, Honestly, in a lot of groups, that's kind of start what starts happening is somebody presents an idea, and someone else <laughs> sees their idea of what they saw wasn't quite the was same. It quite, well, so they, yeah, yeah. then you start to have a little conflict, and yeah, it's just like that I mean, if anything, you can take away from it, like watching it, is just seeing how. You can See, just well, keep it like going, get, keep it moving. Snappy, yeah. And and after after you've had time to um, sort of get used to each other's styles and the like, but it, it does create a snappy, immersive, in, it, it enjoyable experience. Because while they're playing D and D, I found myself like you know, there's a lot of like really slick produced um, actual plays out there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of them, uh, you know, they go the extra mile when it comes to say. You know, miniatures and, and and the set and everything but watching unsleeping city and sort of seeing like the cool just first off all the models of new york <laughs> like yeah. the terrain that they've got for uh for new york was literally like the first five seconds I was like wait a minute this is not a is this what is this they use a lot of sound effects a lot of foley after the fact uh, yes they, it is a not... produced show yeah right like the, it's pretty clear they're taking a game that's been played and then not you're not just presented with the raw footage of it. They're like taking it and doing voice effects fully, mm -hmm. probably editing it to make it snappier. And so it's an enjoyable experience to just watch. For me personally, getting in, getting really into actual plays is tough because of the lulls and the, you know, it's a game. You're playing it. You don't want the players to feel like that they should be playing a different way just for your benefit. But at the same time, like, I want a really enjoyable experience. And I think they've hit it with this one mm -hmm. um, because it's very well produced, really a lot of cool visuals, and also like this engaging world. Moving kind of along, yeah, uh, yeah. kind of introduce the rest of the uh, yes, let's rest, of the rest of the cast. cast. What are your thoughts on Kogosh, honestly? You got a rat, you got a rat man in the sewers there. I look like kind of a up master splinter. I've got <laughs> like a hooked uh, humpback, I'm about two feet tall. I'm a rat man. Um, I've got like a, a rusty metal staff that kind of looks like a pipe. Uh, and then I wear rags made out of uh, like discarded MTA uh, employee clothes. Uh, and you know, I, I live in the subway tunnels and I take care of the, uh, the discarded uh, people uh, of New York. I like the, co the explicit call outs to Splinter, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the sewer workers who claim to have seen a giant rat. This would be the kind of character that I would feel like I would want to, like, can I be the rat guy? Like, I know mm -hmm. everybody else is being people, but like, is it possible to be the rat person? I would only <laughs> want uh, his character to have access to Find Familiar and then the subsequent flock of familiars. Oh, God. And more turtles yeah. to be your familiars. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, that's yeah. how you. That's could how you, do, go you could do that. Yeah. If Awaken you're a cir them. circle of shepherd, that's how you close that circle. Awaken them, and then uh, <laughs> what? True polymorph them when and you it, get to 17th level. Yep. You awaken them, and then true polymorph them, <laughs> and then you teach them how to fight. And that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but you know what? You gotta have goals. Well, you do have to have goals. A uh, player described him Kogresh as a, a dumpster druid. This was one of those. I was like, can I see your character sheet? Like, can we? I, I want to know if that's just like a flavor thing or if they've like made tweaks to it because they're uh, one of the characters uses a, what's clearly a custom domain, like uh, the city domain for mm -hmm. uh, uh, for Kingston. Just the way they were describing the fact that traffic just kind of gets out of this character's way and. Whenever they need a ride, there's always like a bus near a city bus nearby, or they're just in tune with uh, the city. And like, I, my ears perked up immediately. So I was like, oh, are we gonna see that uh, domain? Hey, hey, like, what, what's is that, is that a ribbon ability? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, wisdom times per day? The DM, you know, crunchy part of me is, is I, I wanna peek behind, see what's going on. Kingston Brown, uh, yeah, it's totally night nurse. Yeah. You know, just just there to patch up people. Patch people uh, up. Both it's mundane and supernatural. He's tuned in and is a steward yeah. Of, yeah. of New York. Um, and, and truly like channeling that cleric vibe without going to like religious priesthood type, right? Like, so as a nurse, as, a, as someone who's like yeah. a fixture of their community, you got that kind of you know, the, the, the supportive role that a cleric is often sort of seen as socially in game worlds, but it's translated into something different. And 
the healing abilities can now make a little bit more sense. And, and just the idea of being so tuned into it, I mean, he's basically like a Daredevil NPC where he gets like the <laughs> my city ability. My city, so sure. dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Nobody does this to my city. And like you can invoke your city. Like, yeah. I mean, it's I, I love that, uh, at least that's how I see you know, the origins of that, where that comes from. Yeah. Um, also, uh, the authority was is Jack Hawk. Jack Hawksmore Hawk, is the other Hawksmore. one. Yeah. yeah. Ha he, Jack Hawksmore is a it, it, the god of cities and has that same kind of uh, you know powers based on the size of the city he's in. Yeah, and yeah. The, the condition that it's in. But know. I love those inspirations. Like I just immediately think of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then moving on down, you have Siobhan uh, Thompson playing Misty Moore, the Broadway diva, which is like the perfect realization of of a College of Lore bard. I mean, a, <laughs> right. a bard at all, bard but I love right. that she's a College of Lore because uh, obviously she is something other than human, something more ancient. I like Seems the mystery. Like, yeah, the, there's a lot of mystery there with, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's just one line in particular time I was like, oh, it's been 40 or 50 years, this body sounds like it's letting you down. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it's just like, well, what do you do? Do you, are you some kind of weird elf and like you have to remake your body every so often and that's your, the way you're doing an elf or is it something else? Are they a yeah. revenant? Are they, Yeah, you know? yeah. Is it sinister? <laughs> I didn't catch a vibe of it being a dark world, no, but I did catch a vibe of it being a, it's a dangerous one and one where, like, I mean, it's mutant Santas that they're fighting who yeah. contract a candy, like, you contract a candy bone disease where you get bitten by them. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all started because of a bunch of pixies. Like, well, I mean, there's was... something deeper, though. There's an infernal, there is there's an infernal uh, influence there. Yeah. You have to try to blame it on the Fae. I mean, something is going on here whenever yeah. mutant Santas are vomiting right. cold candy canes on you. Yeah, it's... it's... And, uh, and our last uh, PC oh, yes. by Zach. Uh, Zach plays uh, a yeah. firefighter named Ricky Matsui, uh, who's an Oath of Devotion paladin, uh -huh. which to me is like, that's perfect. Because yeah, you yeah. have your axe, you, you can bang down the door there, you're all about helping people, all about uh, just, that's all you want to do is help. Mm -hmm. But uh, just uh, Sophia uh, interacting with him and like him being Mr. Mr. March, March in, yeah. her, in her firefighter's <laughs> calendar. It just, I don't know. It's it, really it, funny. Again, it's, it's just because just, they're so snappy, right? Yeah. Like there's no lag, there's no like, mm -hmm. it's funny. Yeah, it's not. A, that's not a dig at other actual plays because there's plenty of actual plays that you know that I enjoy that are funny and and yeah. But they're not just funny people; they're professionally funny, <laughs> you know. And it's, uh -huh. so in that sense, it's really, really one of the, the first ones I've seen where I'm like laughing out loud on the floor, like holy shit, this yeah, is yeah. really good. <laughs> yeah, the moment that that totally <laughs> slew me was when uh, Misty Boar wanted to do uh, the Bard yeah. wanted to do like an Arcana check. Uh -huh. They're like, well, you know, Arcana, you, you know, whatever. Just like, well, I don't have a proficiency in that. And he's like, wait, you're a spellcaster. You don't have, prof you don't, you know, you don't have proficiency in Arcana. And she's uh -huh. like, I don't study magic, darling. I am magic. Yeah, and it's just yeah, like, <laughs> that, yeah, that makes that's a, a, that's a perfect go. representation of how a bard would see themselves. They there just are. Yeah, they know? just are. Yeah. I liked Ricky's character, the Paladin, because it's hard to do like good guy, a do-gooder, a do-gooder, someone that wants to do right by others and to, and to help them and improve their lives and not be patronizing, uh, you know, or, or just obnoxious as a, as a character concept. So I found like the portrayal of Ricky is just kind of a, almost like a Vaughn from community type. We're just like, yeah, I'm just I'm here for good vibes and chill yeah. times and yeah. and what it is like going to the gym is just is cheaper than therapy. But it fits, right? Like you've mm -hmm. you've got the archetypes of a D and D party. You've got the character classes, and presumably we'll know more about how you know magic interacts with the world and why others, normies, muggles, whatever you want to call them, whatever they call them, don't see all of the crazy things around them. Um, it's got depth to it that like if presented with as as just a standard fantasy game then at least for me i might not be as engaged by it so like if you're looking for something new or different or you've ever asked us about d20 modern <laughs> and urban fantasy games then yeah, maybe check it out see what uh, see what you think oh um most definitely yeah. um because again uh, you're going to get some great pcs you're going to get a, a gm that has a lot of voices and a lot of pretty memorable PCs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the doctor, the the archmage later, his grandkids that are getting attacked sure, in Times sure. Square. I mean, like a lot of the NPCs, the trash can, like we're just remembering them from just watching this once and it's sure. it's it's uh, you know, it's it's going to make you we're going to make you think. So maybe just check it out. It's weird, it's bizarre, uh -huh. it's funny. 
engaging yeah. and and something different. Uh, and in that respect, it's worth a watch and worth uh, worth checking out. Yeah. Well, Jim, with the scent of magic and candy canes still in the air, mm -hmm. I just want to let everyone know, those first three episodes are available on the Dimension 20 YouTube channel, but if you like what you see there, go to dropout.tv and use the code ROLL50 for 50% 50 off the first month of your subscription. You also get the first week for free. There you can find all 17 episodes of The Unsleeping City. So check it out uh, and uh, tell us what you think.